name is Leah Costello, and I'm the host of this evening's Behind the Spin event series with the Fraser Institute. Uh, you know, with this series, we always try very hard to bring you controversial and thought-provoking speakers. Unfortunately, the best we could do tonight was Ezra Levant. <laughs> uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you so much to our sponsors for tonight's event and for our whole series, The National Post, Business in Vancouver, Vancouver View and Infamous Magazine, Ezra and I actually worked at the Fraser Institute in 1994 as interns. He went on from there to become a very successful lawyer, a fantastic politician, and as most of you know, the former, the publisher of the Western Standard magazine. He did incredible things with this magazine, uh, increasing distribution and really becoming a forum for free speech on all sorts of issues. I read his book this weekend, and I hope many of you have had a chance to, and I know many of you have bought some, and all I can say is when you start reading his book, make sure you've got nothing else planned because it's a page turner and you'll have difficulties putting it down. Now someone in the book, Mark Stein I believe, introduced Ezra as a loudmouth and a blowhard. He, he violated my human rights. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for that friendly introduction. And thanks to the friends here. I mean, I, I feel great. I feel I mean, the book's uh, on the top five of the Amazon.ca bestseller list. Uh, three days into the book tour, we stocked out and had to do an emergency second printing. That's great news for a book that I think covers a topic that Mickey Couch would call the under news, a story that sort of happens underneath the radar of most of the mainstream media. But I wouldn't be here today with a smile on my face and a, and a, a book on the shelves if it weren't for the support of hundreds of people who chipped in to help me cover my legal fees. Over the last year and a half, I've been hit with not one, but three human rights complaints, four defamation suits brought by people in the human rights industry, 14 complaints to the Law Society to get me disbarred, because I keep using the phrase kangaroo court, <laughs> and one copyright suit, because someone claims to have copyrighted the image of Mohammed, and I'm not allowed to run cartoons of him, apparently. <laughs> Altogether, it's over 20 legal actions, and it's designed, uh, it's, it's a coin of phrase, to be lawfare, warfare using the law. And that's actually what happened to me three years ago. When I published the Danish cartoons of Mohammed, it wasn't done in a particularly provocative way. For those of you who are subscribers to the Western Standard, you'll remember, it wasn't on the cover of the magazine, it was tucked inside. And we had a thoughtful sidebar showing that not all Muslims hold that you can't depict Mohammed. We showed a Shiite mosaic, centuries old, of Mohammed to demonstrate that point. And it was styled not as a hot news story, but a media analysis. I mean, we were a fortnightly magazine, so by the time we write something and it actually went to print, it would take about three weeks, so we thought for sure other newspapers and magazines and TV shows would have already covered the news. We would just be analyzing why people were so self-censorious about this, but it turns out we were the only folks to run the mail, the only magazine, the only TV station. No one did it except for us. Now, I, we launched a great debate. And we ran many letters pro and con. But one fellow was so upset, not upset enough to write a letter to the editor, but upset enough to go to the Calgary Police Service and ask them to arrest me. Now, they were very polite. His name was Syed Sorawardi. He's a <laughs> radical imam born in Pakistan, does the Saudi lecture circuit. And he came here, and I actually debated him on the radio, and he was left in such a huff. I went on, I mean, I debate people and make them angry all the time. But this fella went to the cops and said, arrest Ezra Levant. And they refused because they explained to him, look, this is Canada, it's not Saudi Arabia where indeed I would have committed an offense, where the Quran is the Constitution. This is Canada and you can be Muslim and you can be Jewish and you can be atheist and we can all get along in a pluralistic society governed by Queen Elizabeth laws, just don't force yourself on someone else. So he shot the complaint around town until he found someone so illiberal that they would take it and run with it. And how perverse that in the 21st century the police care more about civil liberties than something called the Human Rights Commission. And so for 900 days, it's, it's strange, isn't it? 
I wonder what Martin Luther King, I mean, he would just never believe that. Or Mahatma Gandhi, if you would have gone back in time and said, imagine a day when the cops care more about your tender civil liberties than someone called a human rights activist. For 900 days I was pursued. I did an access to information request. Most of my requests have been stonewalled, but one that did come back was a list of all the bureaucrats. 15 lawyers and bureaucrats pursued me for 900 days. CSI Miami's Horatio Kane has a smaller staff on CSI Miami, and he's only only going after murders. <laughs> and the book's called Shakedown because about halfway into it, well, but by the way, when I first got the complaint, I thought, okay, I get it. They're going through the motions just like the police did. The police actually wrote this imam a very polite letter explaining to him why they would not charge me. They didn't even phone me to their credit. And I thought, okay, the Human Rights Commission is going through the motions. And I wrote a five-page letter, my lawyer, calmed it down, and I looked at the letter when I wrote this book, and I thought, gee whiz, I was so optimistic, and I was so calm, and I was so polite, because I actually thought they would go away. I was wrong. Anyways, a, about a year into things, when the legal bills were starting to rack up, and they were making demands of me to come downtown for an interrogation, and my lawyer was saying, well, you better go, because if you don't go willingly, they have certain powers in this Human Rights Commission. They can enter your office without any notice, without a search warrant, and take copies of anything, any document, including your hard drive. Well, if you're publishing a magazine, and they take your hard drive, that's basically putting you out of business. If a policeman would have bust into my office without a warrant, I know what I would say. I would try and be polite, but I would say, leave, sir, or I'll charge you with trespass. Put down that computer, sir, or I'll charge you with theft. But if it's a human rights cop, they have powers that even police don't have, and I have fewer rights than an accused drug dealer or murderer. Anyways, when I started to feel that the system was a little bit tilted against me, when I started to taste the cost of the lawyers, they made a plea bargain. That's where the book's title comes from, Shakedown. If I were to give this imam a few thousand dollars in pain and suffering money, and a page in the magazine unedited, I could go free. And you know what? If I wasn't such a stubborn mule, I might have actually considered taking it. Because a couple thousand bucks, swallowing my pride and running his propaganda for a page, I could survive to, uh, to fight another day. And for most business people, for whom fighting is not what they do for a living, they're tempted to take it. Because I actually went the full 900 days, and when I was acquitted, I won, hooray! And I had a $100,000 legal bill, and thank you to those who helped chip in. That's called winning, because unlike in civil court, if you win a human rights court case, you do not get your costs paid. Because 40 or 50 years ago when these human rights commissions were invented, the idea was it would be a little whistleblower taking on a giant corporation and you must protect the whistleblower from retaliation. Well look at it today, it's such an invitation to abuse and bullying, people are attracted to it because of the moral hazard. They can be harassers, they can be a nuisance, they can file frivolous or vexatious lawsuits, they can engage in the soft jihad of lawfare to silence critics of radical Islam, which is what happened in my case and the case of Mark Stein, and be immune to the costs. A real court would have awarded me my costs, not a human rights court, a kangaroo court. In fact, the statute specifically bars me from going after costs. I think that's a problem. But, but hate speech, which is what I was charged under the section in Alberta, only accounts for 2% of the workload of Canada's Human Rights Commissions. There's 14 of these commissions, one in every territory and province, and there's a, a federal one. They employ about 1,000 people nationally. They have an annual budget of about $200 million. That is what we call an industry. And the thing is, when you start an industry in the 40s, sorry, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, when most of these human rights commissions were built, there were some inequities in Canada. I mean, a Jew might not be allowed to join the country club, and and you know the idea of a a Haitian woman being our governor general was unthinkable. The idea of a Sikh premier or a woman prime minister or a disabled man being the mayor, I mean, those things were probably unthinkable in the 50s or 60s. And so I can understand at least the idea behind a human rights commission, even if there were flaws there from the outset. But if you fast forward the clock to the 21st century, when we are the most harmonious and tolerant country in the world, we get along better than any place else that's not actually 
racially homogeneous like say Japan. I mean, we really do it better than anyone else, but you have this permanent core of grievance mongers who depend on trouble for their income. If you pay someone to find trouble, they probably will. 